Welcome to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 2. We're going to be focusing on actually just a few verses in Luke chapter 2 this morning. Luke chapter 2, verses 36, 37, and 38. But so that we can appreciate the context of those verses, I'm going to begin reading all the way back in verse 25. So we understand what's, what's happening. So verse 25 of Luke chapter 2, and let's remember as we are reading this, this is God's word full of power to transform our lives, to make us more godly in 2022 than we have been in 2021, more full of the Holy Spirit, more passionate about the Lord Jesus. Let's invite the Lord to do that even as we read. Let's begin reading in Luke chapter 2, verse 25, as we get to our verses. This morning. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Now our passage this morning. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God And to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Lord, bless the preaching and the obeying of your word. Well, believe it or not, next Sunday will be the new year. This is the last Sunday. No Christmas just yesterday, but this is the last Sunday of this year. And it is our practice as a church to devote the last Sunday to the topic of Thanksgiving. And as we head towards this new year, when, as you know, gyms will be packed for a few weeks, and diets will be viral for a few weeks, and the sale of kale will be up for a few weeks, and everyone will attempt to repent of Christmas indulgences. Now, let's imagine for a moment that there was a single physical thing that could indicate to you that you were in good health. Imagine if there was such a thing. There isn't such a thing, although the internet internet might beg to differ. Imagine there was such a thing, a single thing, that could indicate to you that you were in good health. It would be that thing that the doctors always ask first when you went to your checkup. Are you doing this? And if you are doing it, there's a good chance, a really good chance you're in good health. And if you're not doing it, there's a really good chance you are in poor health. Now, there there isn't such a thing. But let's imagine, for example, or for perhaps in our spiritual condition, if there were such a thing. Now, I don't think there is one of those things either. There's no one thing that could indicate absolutely. But I would, I would propose that thankfulness comes pretty close. If there was a practice that could indicate in, in just a single instance Whether someone is spiritually healthy or spiritually weak, I would propose asking the question, is this person thankful? Are they a thankful person? That would go pretty close to indicating how are you doing spiritually. It's not the only thing, of course, but it comes pretty close. Thankfulness, and that is why every year on the last Sunday of the year and sprinkled throughout the year in various sermons, of course you'll hear this topic, but... We devote this, this 
year, this week, to this theme of thankfulness, because I believe it is so important, so crucial. And this morning, we get to hear from this example of this woman, Anna, who is a part of the early birth narratives of Jesus Christ and is noted as one who responded to the Redeemer with thankfulness. And I want to learn from her this morning. Charles Spurgeon says this about this topic. He says, he who would serve God must begin by praising God. For a grateful heart, listen to this, is the mainspring of obedience. We must offer the salt of gratitude with the sacrifice of obedience. Our lives should be anointed with the precious oil of thankfulness. As soldiers march to music, so while we walk in the paths of righteousness, we should keep step to the notes of thanksgiving. Larks sing as they mount, so should we magnify the Lord for his mercies while we are winging our way to heaven. I want us to learn from this woman this morning, whose thankfulness at the first sight of Jesus resounded through the temple, so much so that her story is included for all time in these stories about Jesus' arrival. I want us to focus this morning on her thankfulness for him as the Redeemer and to examine our lives for this very important evaluating question and to cultivate it as we head into the new year. We want to notice a few things about this story, these three verses that are contained in chapter 2 of Luke, and then I want to seek to apply it to our own lives. Just a few things we want to note. First, the opening verses indicate, if you know anything of your Old Testament history, her need of redemption. Her need of redemption is made very clear right from the beginning. This woman is called a prophetess, very unusual and honoring title, meaning she represented the Lord in some way. She was the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. Now, Asher had been one of the tribes that had been judged by God for their rebellion, their sinfulness. They had been lost to exile. And yet we have here a surviving, a a survivor that probably was very, very few of them. But she is a survivor of this tribe of Asher, so her tribe would be a reminder of God's judgment against Israel because of their sin. The ten tribes had left the kingdom of Judah. They had left the throne of David. They had sought allegiance elsewhere. You can read about that in the Old Testament. And they had been judged. And here here is this woman, a lone survivor, a survivor, so to speak, of the tribe of Asher. And her life story reminds any reader of the need of a redeemer to come to Israel. Israel had wandered away from the covenant of God for years, year after year, century after century. They had been judged. They had been exiled. They had been void for hundreds of years of any prophetic word of comfort. And so her story in and of itself is a reminder of the need of redemption. Not only her story uh, in terms of her family background, but her personal story. It says in the passage she was advanced in years. She had been married. She had lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84 years old. So this woman has experienced a lifetime of being alone and in that culture vulnerable. Unlike the story of Ruth... There was no Boaz for this widow. Nobody had come as her protector. Nobody had come as her companion. No kinsman redeemer had come to rescue her. So her family story and her personal story indicate a real need of redemption. Right at the outset, we see this sense of need. Here is a a woman whose background is tragic in her family and whose personal life is tragic in that she has lived alone, unaided, uncomforted, uncared for, for decades. So the writer, I think Luke, wants us to understand the depth of her need. And yet, in her need, there are also signals, clues of hope. The fact that she is a surviving member of the tribe of Asher is an indication that God did not utterly destroy his people when he sent them into exile. Here is a woman whose very existence indicates some sense of God's lingering and ongoing and steadfast mercy towards his people. And that leads to the second thing we want to note in this passage, which is her hope for redemption. What has she done, having lived alone, 
of this bereft tribe all these years. What has she done? Well, she has not departed from the temple. We read in verse 37. And there she worships with fasting and prayer night and day. This woman's life is defined by a love for the presence of God as revealed by her constant attendance at the temple, by her fasting, which indicates her longing for God's redemption was even greater than her physical hunger, and by her prayer showing she would spend the time she had in intercession, likely for her people, likely that God would fulfill his promises. She knew the desperate need of the people of Israel for a Redeemer, and she longed to see the mighty son of David that God had promised. She wanted to see victory over God's enemies. She wanted to see the hope of Jerusalem. She wanted to see God restore the fortunes of his people and grant them mercy in the face of hundreds of years of rebellion. Like Daniel before her, she interceded crying out and dedicating herself to the hope of redemption. Just for a brief aside, it's worth remembering that Anna lived in a different era of redemption history than we do, but it is worth noting that just as she longed for the first coming of Christ, so should we long and fast and pray towards the second coming of Christ. She is a model, I think, for us, knowing even less than we do about the promises of God and redemption of his people, she lived her life longing towards those promises. She's an example, I think, of passion for God's presence. This woman models Psalm 27.4, which says, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Here is something that ought to be said even more of us than of this woman We who know much more of the promises of God and have been given the indwelling Holy Spirit to be with us much better than a physical temple, it should be said of us that one thing we long for is to see the beauty of the Lord and to enjoy His temple. Surely her life could be described by Psalm 84, 1 and 2, which says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. We'll study more of Psalm 84, Lord willing, next Sunday. But I just want to note here, this woman is an example for us, as she will be of her thanksgiving for redemption, so she ought to be an example of her longing for the gift of redemption, which is life in the presence of God. The best she could was to go to the temple, which symbolized God's presence in its sacrificial atoning forgiveness for sin, and she could enjoy the presence of God in that physical structure. We have so much more to enjoy with the presence of the Holy Spirit among us, and we also ought to be people who could be described as living night and day, not in a particular physical location, but in the presence of God, longing for Him, seeking Him, longing after Him, and trusting in Him. Now, this woman came into the temple as she always does, day after day, apparently, without fail, longing, praying, interceding, Lord, redeem your people. Send him. Perhaps she studied 2 Samuel 7, the promise of a mighty son that would come and take over the throne of David. Lord, send him. Redeem your people. Perhaps she read about Gideon and Samson. She thought, oh, Lord, a Savior, a saving king. Send him. And this day she walks in. And suddenly, by faith, there he is. And we don't know how she knew. Perhaps the Holy Spirit revealed it to her directly. In light of the context, it seems she came in at the same time that Simeon was holding the child, and he's proclaiming his own joy and prophecies over the baby. 
Perhaps they'd been attending the temple for years together. And she sees the look on his face and hears the joy in his voice and she has no doubt. And suddenly, in this elderly woman, there is an unusual swing in her step as she comes up to Mary and Joseph and Simeon with the baby. She sees him. Yes, in infant form, but her fasting and her prayer give way to faith and confidence that this child will be the fulfillment of all of her redemption hopes. Here he is. And by faith she believes that all of God's promises are yes and amen in him. And then we want to notice her response to the Redeemer. First of all, we want to notice that it required faith. As we read elsewhere, without faith, it is impossible to please God. All of the revelations of God required some level of faith. And this is no different. She comes up to a baby, as I mentioned two days ago. This, this baby has no signals of royalty. There's no angelic host right there in the temple. It's just a mother and a father and an infant. And somehow she is able to believe by faith that this is indeed the mighty, conquering, victorious son of David, the redeemer of the people of God. So it required faith. It, it wasn't as if, as if right there in front of her was the mighty victor in all of his heavenly glory. No, it was just a baby, just like any baby. So it required faith, first of all, and that faith then gives way to thankfulness. That's what we're going to zero in on this morning. She began to give thanks to God. What comes out of this woman who has been longing for redemption when she considers this one who is redemption? It is thankfulness and spreading that thankfulness to anyone who, like her, is waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. She gives thanks. The person who truly by faith comes across the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, should surely, among many other things they ought to do, should surely be described as a thankful person. If there is one thing that certainly the good news of Jesus ought to produce, it is thankfulness. It is an abounding thankfulness. It's a resounding thankfulness. Thankfulness ought to be the mark of the person who has encountered Jesus Christ by faith. Thankfulness ought to be the mark of the person who has encountered Jesus Christ by faith. It ought to define them. It ought to flow out of them. It ought to be resounding from their lips. They should be known, above all else, as a thankful person. Thankfulness, because here is the Redeemer. And I don't mean thankfulness in the way that perhaps the, the culture talks of thankfulness and be optimistic and let's count our blessings and come generic kind of way. I'm talking about thankfulness for the Lord Jesus. I'm talking about gospel thankfulness, thankfulness that is biblical, holy thankfulness, not optimism or kind of a superficial let's help each other out as members of humanity. No, I'm talking about thankfulness that God has come to earth as a man and has redeemed the people that ought to have been his enemies. A holy thankfulness ought to be true of the people of God at all times and conditions in their life. Now, how, how can we press this story into our own lives? As we examine this last year, as we ask this question are you thankful as the doctor, the physician of our souls comes to us and asks what I think is a, a very telling, a very poignant, a very insightful question. Are you thankful? How is thankfulness going in your life? How is thankfulness for Christ going in your life? This will indicate in a way that few other questions could, whether you are healthy or sick, whether you are growing or declining, whether you are strong or vulnerable. Are you thankful for the Lord Jesus? Are you full of thankfulness? Are you abounding in thankfulness? Now, three aspects of this thankfulness that were true of her that I want to press into our own lives this morning. First of all, we should be thankful for the mercy of redemption. We should be thankful for the mercy of redemption. As I mentioned, the story, the way this this book works. It's a narrative, and the story communicates through narrative. That's, that's the genre. It's not going to say we should be thankful because of the depth of our need. It's going to describe the depth of her need and then describe her as being thankful, and that's how it delivers its point. But we should see our own need in this description of this woman. We also 
are a part of a family tree that, is, that ought to be bereft of any hope. We also are part of a family tree that has been exiled from the presence of God because we are of the tribe of Adam. And we have all been exiled from the presence of God. Not only that, but in our own sinfulness, we are desperately in need of a kinsman redeemer to come to us in our exile. We also, like her, are alone, separated from God, hating God and hating one another. So we should see, I think, in ourselves the desperate need that is then answered by God's mercy of redemption. Like this woman, we had nothing to look back on that could present us to God favorably and nothing to look at in ourselves or in our condition that makes us impressive to God. Instead, we simply have a hope that God will be merciful and then here He is in the person of Jesus. So the mercy of redemption is a a constant reason for thankfulness, that God chose to send himself in the person of his son to people who had been rightly exiled from his presence, who rightly deserved nothing but his judgment, who were not those who would adorn heaven in any way. He sends himself to rescue us. So the mercy of redemption ought to be a cause for thankfulness all the time. So how is your thankfulness for the mercy represented by the coming of the Lord Jesus? Are we thankful for mercy? It's a good test of the condition of our souls. How thankful are you that God has had mercy on you? It's very easy once we attain a certain level of kind of social maturity to forget that we are the recipients of undeserved mercy. But if we don't remember that we're the recipients of undeserved mercy, we will quickly lose sight of the glory of the Redeemer, and our hearts will grow cold and confident instead of humble and grateful. We, we want to be those who grow more grateful the older we get, not more self-assured as we approach death. We, we want to be those who are more broken by the surprise of Jesus' arrival and less presumptuous that God would show mercy to us? Are you grateful for mercy? Is is that descriptive of your life? If you're a parent, would your children say, well, one thing that's certainly true about dad is he is grateful for the mercy of God in his life. If, If you're a mom, does that come out as you are parenting your children, your gratefulness for the mercy of God in your life? Listen, you can see the contrast when we are self-confident and self-righteous. What gets diminished? The glory of Jesus as the merciful Redeemer. Would your children, would your neighbors, would your friends, would your co-workers know? You are grateful for mercy. Far more grateful for mercy than condescending towards others' failures. Are you grateful for that's what that's true of this woman? Notice what comes out of her. He's here. God has shown mercy to his rebellious people. Somehow, all of her years of prayer and fasting had caused her to be more grateful and amazed at the coming of the Redeemer and not impressed at her own devotion. We have to be careful that our devotion towards the Lord doesn't become a substitute for gratefulness for His mercy. How is your thankfulness for mercy? I just want to use a a very personal example. When you sin in some way, when we sin in some way, does that end up in gratefulness? Here's, Here's a good test for your heart. Now, this week by, by itself, I'm sure you could look back at some moment where you were impatient, you were selfish, you were arrogant, you were proud, you complained, something happened this week. Let me ask you, did that moment end up in gratefulness for redemption? It's amazing. We're, we're, we can all be sort of like little legalists, even though we claim to be gospel-centered people. It's a, imagine, if I, if I can use an illustration, imagine that you have this wonderful Christmas dinner with all the food laid out, and it's it's been eaten and devoured, and now the table is a disaster. Imagine if you have four or five-year-olds, and so eating is not a pretty situation. And it's a disaster. It's a mess. 
And then what you do to prepare for the next meal is to take out a large white tablecloth and just lay it over all of the mess, all of the plates and cups and just lumpy and everything. And then you bring the family and you say, okay, let's, let's have our next meal. And you somehow attempt to put a meal on top of that and then have another meal. And it's a mess, even more so because of the first mess. And you say, well done, let's, let's head to bed. And then you come back the next day and you lay another tablecloth over that mess. That's sometimes what we're like when it comes to our sin. It's not that we don't know that it ought to be covered over somehow. So we, we acknowledge, okay, we, we, yeah, we shouldn't do that. Let's, let's, not, let's not do that anymore. We need to stop doing that. We, we sort of cover it over by forgetfulness or by determining that we're going to do better the next time. We'll be neater tomorrow. Let's try again. Oh, gosh, we, we weren't that much better this week. Let's try again. Wow, it just seems to pile up. Let's try again. The, the try again, again doctrine of salvation is, is worthless. It doesn't work. Let, let's try again. But even Christians who should know better, do it that way. Oh, I was really angry this week. I'm going to try hard not to be angry next week. I'll try again. Gosh, I was angry again. I'll try again. And we sort of cover over our past sins with the try again tablecloth. And yet we find that doesn't actually lead to joy or peace at all. We do this in little moments and in big moments. We have a sort of try again gospel that doesn't lead to thankfulness because what are we doing? We're not acknowledging our need for redemption. We're just trying again. Brothers and sisters, that is not why this woman is rejoicing. She's not rejoicing because they're going to go back into the desert and try again for hundreds of years. She's rejoicing because in spite of their failure, there is someone who can make them clean. Who can clean them. The same is true of us. Now let me, let me invite you to examine your heart for a moment. When you sin, do you give in to the, I'll try again. That was bad. I won't do that anymore. Now, you should not do that anymore. I'm not saying go do that anymore. I'm saying that little moment of transaction does not lead to gratefulness because who's the redeemer? You. And are you good at it? No. Instead, what ought to happen in little moments and big is that was a mess. I was angry. I was selfish. I was independent of God. I was self-confident. That, that was a mess. And isn't it good news that we have a redeemer? who took our sin on himself and who redeems us. So that little moment of conviction, what ought to happen? Lord, I sinned against you again. And that sin can only be cleaned by your redemption. And you are a sufficient redeemer. And you have washed me clean. So now I am totally clean in your sight and I didn't do a thing to clean myself. Look at how clean you have made my record before you. Now, what does that do? It leads to thanksgiving. What if you were to come down to that table again that used to be a disaster, and you find it sparkling, clean, and you did nothing to get it there? And you turn, and there is one who has cleaned it thoroughly and perfectly. What do you say to that person? Thank you. Little moments of sin in our life sometimes do not end up in thankfulness for redemption the way they should. They end up with a kind of, I'll do better next time, gospel, which is no gospel at all. Brothers and sisters, thankfulness should come out when we see the mercy of redemption, that it is all of Christ and all of grace and not of us. This woman was not rejoicing because of joy that God would give them another chance. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's cross the Red Sea. Let's try again. This time, don't grumble. This time, don't be idolatrous. This time, don't divide the kingdom. This time, don't worship idols. No. She's rejoicing because the Redeemer has come. And the Redeemer would do more even than she could imagine. He would wash away the record of sin of his people, and he would give them a banquet in its place. Are you moving from appropriate conviction to gratefulness for redemption in little moments of... It doesn't take long. It takes three seconds. 
You shout at somebody on the road, get out of the way, you, whatever you call them. Lord, I was angry. Thank you for redeeming me by your death in my place. Keep driving. And that doesn't take any longer than saying, I shouldn't be angry next week. But it's a big difference what it causes you to feel towards the Lord Jesus. Honey, why do you always... Lord, I was angry. I was prideful. Thank you for paying for my pride. Thank you for the forgiveness of your redemption. Moments of sin should always result in thankfulness for redemption. If they don't, you will become a tablecloth Christian that just tries again and again and again. This woman saw the Redeemer. We have as many opportunities as we sin, (laughs) which is a lot, to see the Redeemer. Let's take them. Let's turn moments of sin into moments of gratefulness for redemption. The mercy of redemption should be a theme of our thankfulness, and not only the mercy of redemption for our salvation, the mercy of redemption in everyday blessings as well. Aside from the forgiveness he offers, the Lord in his generosity provides a thousand mercies every day. A thousand mercies every day who have eyes to see them. When you get in the habit of thanksgiving, you will begin to see reasons for thanksgiving that extend far beyond just forgiveness and reconciliation with God into everyday blessings that are all over your life. Now, here's the problem. If you skip the first part, you tend to think of God as someone who gives blessings to sinful humanity and has no interest in being reconciled with them. This is the problem with the blessing theology of our day and age. Oh, God gives me a lot of blessings. God's blessed me in my life. And they never give God thanks for forgiveness The first blessing that he gives is forgiveness, reconciliation with him. We should have no interest in external blessings that don't start with relationship with God. But if you have relationship with God, and you have been reconciled by the death of Jesus Christ, and you are headed to heaven, then you are free to see a thousand other blessings that he has poured out on you every day. And too often, our souls are sluggish. We are sluggish to see the thousand blessings that the Lord has poured out on his people every day. Now, I cannot say that better than Martin Luther. So let's just listen to Martin Luther in his unrepeatable style, offering this correction to the lack of gratefulness, especially when we are prone to complaining. He says this, We are such weaklings and suffering martyrs, When even one leg hurts or a small sore swells, that we can fill heaven and earth with cries and howls, grumbling and cursing. We do not see what a tiny evil such a small thing is compared to the countless blessings that God provides. Snorers that we are, God lets us experience these minor troubles so that we may be awakened from our deep sleep and be driven by knowledge and realization to consider what would happen if the great and countless blessings present to us disappeared because God's favor turned away from us. There are a thousand reasons every day to remember that God is merciful towards those he has redeemed. And these should not be neglected in thanksgiving. And if they are, that neglect is in and of itself sin. John Calvin adds this. In the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, there can be no interruption without sin. Since God does not cease to heap benefits upon benefits in order to impel us, those slow and lazy, to gratefulness. In short, we are well nigh overwhelmed by so great and so plenteous an outpouring of good blessings, by so many and mighty miracles discerned wherever one looks, that we never lack reason and occasion for praise and thanksgiving. We never lack reason or occasion for praise and thanksgiving. Therefore, to neglect praise and thanksgiving, Calvin would say, is surely a sin. 
since there are all around us an abundance of reasons for praise and thanksgiving, starting first and foremost and primarily with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in our place and extending beyond to a thousand moments where God in his kindness gives us things we do not deserve and is, a, is an example of his favor on us each day rises with new mercies. Brothers, should we not be like this woman Having seen Jesus Christ by faith, should we not see all that we have through him as an example of God's favor and kindness towards us? And should that not result in being people filled with thankfulness, abounding in thankfulness? And haven't you met people like this? Haven't you met people like this who are strong in this area? And aren't they a delight that you cannot meet them without being affected and hit in the faith with some gratefulness. You can't talk to them without them finding their way to some evidence of God's blessing. You can't even complain with them without them turning around to remind you and them of how grateful we ought to be for the goodness of God. Isn't that kind of a person the kind of person we are all called to be? Because of the mercy of redemption. These next two will be more brief, but let me hit them briefly. The hope of his redemption, another reason for gratefulness. Now, this woman, as I said, mentions a, an era of history that was mostly longing, mostly longing, and then at the coming of Jesus, you do notice a transition in the New Testament to an accent of thankfulness. You notice that transition. It's not that there is no lament in the New Testament or no thankfulness in the Old, but there is a transition in accent. The New Testament has an accent on thankfulness because of greater revelation of God's mercy. In other words, we have seen more of God's mercy in Jesus than the people of Israel saw in Egypt. We have seen more of God's mercy in Jesus than the people of Israel saw in David. And since we have seen more of God's mercy and there is more confidence we have to have hope in him, then the thankfulness of that hope should describe our lives in an even greater way than it did for this woman. The Lord has not forgotten his people as they live in spiritual exile in this age either. He has not forgotten his people as they are tossed around by the powers of this age, as they are alone, perhaps, as this woman was, or they feel alone in this world as they face suffering while they wait for the promise to come. They can also, like her, exist in a kind of thankful hope. Now, she did not have the fulfillment of the promise when she saw, when she saw that baby. She merely had the sight of its arrival. Did you notice that? Nothing about this woman's condition changed. Rome wasn't defeated, Israel was still in captivity, she was still a widow, and she was old. And yet she is overflowing with thankfulness. Her fasting gives way to joy, though nothing in her external condition changed. Now there is something we can learn about that. What, what did she have in a fresh way? She had hope. She had a surge of hope because here he was. Well, we have hope of the return of our Lord Jesus. And therefore, we also ought to give thanks for the hope that we have. It is, it is deeply troubling when Christians are more known for their frustration and concern about the ways of the world than they are for their hope for the world to come. Christians ought not to be more known for their frustration and concern about the ways of this world that they already know is doomed to destruction than they are known for hope because the Lord Jesus is coming again. Listen, when, when Peter says, always be ready to give a reason, what? For why you think this world is terrible. That is not how he finishes that sentence. Always be ready to give your reason for why you think it stinks right now. And yet, honestly, if we were to look at our own hearts, isn't that often the case? Man, ask me. I got a lot of reasons why I think it's terrible right now. I can list them out for you. They are articulate and effective and organized. But that's not what we're called to do. We're called to give a reason for the hope that we have. 
We are to be known as those who have a ready reason for hope. We are thankful for hope. We are abounding in hope. This woman was abounding in a kind of thankful hope. And brothers and sisters, we ought to be as well. We ought to be abounding in a kind of thankfulness for hope. I'm headed to heaven. I'm headed to heaven. I was talking to some dear friends a couple of months ago. Dear friends, for decades, they're not in this church. She's now in her second round battling cancer. She's facing all the expected worries that you could imagine would come with that, some of the physical trials that come with that. And she was beaming with hope. That is what we ought to be. That is what we ought to be. Not because we've realized the return of the Lord, but because we believe it is coming. She hadn't realized the fulfillment of the redemption, but she knew it was coming. And we ought to be the same. Abounding in a kind of thankfulness that just oozes forth with hope. That ought to be present in our lives even in the midst of difficulty and suffering, which sometimes lingers and ought to be, as Spurgeon said, salted with thanksgiving. Spurgeon again says this, this blending of thanks with devotion is always to be maintained. Always must we offer prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. No matter though the prayer should struggle upward out of the depths, yet... Must its wings be silvered over with thanksgiving? Though the prayer were offered upon the verge of death, yet in the last few words which the trembling lips can utter, there should be notes of gratitude as well as words of petition. The hope of redemption ought to be the theme of our gratefulness. Brothers and sisters, this ought to be the theme of our gratefulness. We have hope because of this Redeemer. Final application, the community of redemption. We are grateful for mercy. We are grateful for hope. We are grateful among a community of redemption. Notice that she does not keep her gratefulness to herself, but she speaks of this gratefulness to all those who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So she apparently is aware of a community of hope-filled people that need to be told that their hope is beginning to be realized. And she wants to share her gratefulness about Jesus with them. Well, like her, we also exist among a community of people who are called to hope in the Redeemer, and like her, we should share our gratefulness with them. Here's the point. Our gratefulness should go to God and should be continually offered to him, but it should abound also to others. Now, we live in a cynical age that celebrates cynicism instead of thankfulness, but we are Christians, and so we ought to look like exiles in that age and celebrate thankfulness among this community rather than cynicism. Rather than complaining, rather than grumbling, rather than slandering, we are those who are thankful. You notice, I think, that in, say, social media or the internet age, the things that tend to go viral are not an abundance of thankfulness so much as self-righteous outrage. And yet in the church, what ought to go viral is thankfulness. Thankfulness ought to be viral among the people of God. It ought to be contagious. It ought to be transmitted eagerly with fresh zeal at every meeting. My goal when I meet a fellow Christian should be, how can I talk with this person about our thankfulness for redemption and all that redemption has given us? How can I transmit thankfulness to you? How can I help you be more thankful for redemption? I am grateful because you do this to me every week in your singing and in your encouragement and in your helpfulness towards one another, servant's heart toward one another, encouragement of one another, but let's abound still more and more. Let thankfulness be the mark of the community of redemption. Let us be like this woman who spread thankfulness generously all around, who are not reluctant to share. Can 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 we just pause this lunch for a moment? Can I just talk to you? I, I am so grateful for the Lord Jesus and his mercy in my life. 
in the midst of talking about the things in this world that are troubling and difficult, let us insert the viral thanksgiving that should be present in the community of God. Here's the thing to ask about your next conversation. Did I insert a celebration of thankfulness? Did I transmit thankfulness in this conversation? Did that person leave infected by thankfulness? Did they leave affected by my joyful celebration of the hope we have in redemption? When we are in our community groups, are people hearing of us? Here is why I am so thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the definition of this week for me. Are children hearing from their parents the good reasons we have to be thankful? Son, honey, let me tell you the good reasons we have to be thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you believe in him, you have reason to be thankful as well. There is a community that ought to be described by thankfulness as her community was described by thankfulness when she walked out of the temple and went apparently immediately to person after person in that community saying, listen, we have reason to be thankful. Listen, there isn't one pill that's going to make you healthy, and there's not one thing that is the cause of all spiritual maturity. But if there was one, I would recommend this would come pretty close. How is thankfulness doing in your life? Now, here's the wonderful thing about this. It's way easier than preparing for a marathon. It takes work, but it's way easier. Let's just say, for example, that over the last half few months, you would say honestly that right now you see a lot more complaining than thankfulness in your life. Complaining about the culture, complaining about the family, complaining about your marriage, complaining about your car, your house, your neighbors. And you're not seeing a lot of thankfulness. Here's the wonderful thing. You can start today by being thankful for forgiveness. Today. That's the great thing about redemption. Don't just cover it over with a big white tablecloth that says, I'll try again in 2022 to be more thankful, to be a more thankful person, less complaining. Don't do that. Start with thankfulness for forgiveness. Forgiveness, Lord, wherever I've been, complaining, anxious, grumbling, self-righteously indignant towards this world, forgive me and thank you that you do. And now, as my Redeemer, make me a thankful person. And the great thing is, you can begin after that moment of thankfulness for forgiveness, to begin the habit of thankfulness for the thousand blessings that are present every day and spreading that among the community. Fathers, make thankfulness a goal of your home. Mothers, make thankfulness a goal of your parenting. Husbands, make thankfulness a goal of your marriage. Wives, make thankfulness the thing your husband hears most of all. Neighbors, make thankfulness the goal of your conversation across the driveway. Employees, make thankfulness the reputation you have at work. And I'm not talking about general optimism. I'm talking about thankfulness for your salvation to the best degree that you can in the varying relationships that you have. Be a people. Let us be a people that are marked by thankfulness for redemption. Charles Spurgeon says this to close. The constant tenor and spirit of our lives should be adoring gratitude, love, reverence, and thanksgiving to the Most High. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are our Redeemer. And that means, Lord, that you paid the redemption price to save us from the condemnation we deserve for every complaint, every act of grumbling, every act of self-righteous legalism or indignation. And so, Lord, we thank you, first of all, for your forgiveness. Thank you for redeeming us, though we are unworthy. Thank you for washing us clean. Thank you, Lord. And, Lord, in light of your redemption, make us those who are ever singing of you. May our lives be tuned to the song of your redemption. You are our rock. You are our redeemer. Lord, may our days be filled with expressions of our gratefulness.
for you. Receive it, Lord, and receive our song right now. In Jesus' name, amen.